Welcome everybody. We're letting the room populate and while we do, I just want to go over a few housekeeping notes. If you have a question for any of our panelists tonight, please feel free to enter your question at any time using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For the sake of lack of distractions, we have turned your mic and video off, so the way to communicate with us will be through the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll get started momentarily. On behalf of ADL Southwest, Keshet, and Equality Texas, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is a really important conversation that we're going to have, and we are so pleased that you're here with us tonight. We ask that if you have a question for any of our speakers to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Tonight's program is being recorded, and we will make the recording available later this week and you will receive an email confirmation at, with the recording link. At this time, I would love to turn it over to Shannon Saul from, uh, <laughs> who will, who will um, continue on with our program tonight. Shannon. Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, thank you to everyone for being here with us and taking some time to be here out of your busy evenings and lives. Um, my name is Shannon Saul. I use she and they pronouns and I am Cash Out's Community Mobilization Manager. And hopefully you've gotten some time to read a little bit about each of our organizations as you are entering the room. So to go ahead and get us started, I'm going to give folks a little bit of, of an overview about why we're here, why this is a Jewish issue, what's happening across the country. You've probably seen lots of confusing and maybe maddening headlines recently. And then we're gonna talk about what's happening specifically in Texas. And then finally, we'll hear from our wonderful panel about the lived experiences of folks in Texas and how these policies are affecting them. So I just wanna go ahead and get us started with a little bit of Jewish grounding. Um, we are very lucky also to have Cantor Sherry Allen with us to later share a little bit more of this Jewish framing. But I really quickly just wanted folks to see um, the seven Jewish values that Keshet provides for an inclusive community. And I am going to go ahead and paste the PDF version of this in the chat if anyone is interested in looking at it on your own time. But I just want to kind of highlight a few of these that I think might not be something that we typically think of as related to LGBTQ inclusion. So um, for me, a big part of what I love about the Jewish community is how we stand in solidarity um, and how we really see ourselves as a whole community. And I think that that's a really important piece of why we're here, of why it's important that we fight to protect the LGBTQ community. I also want to highlight guarding one's use of language. Um, we might not think about that in relation to using someone's pronouns, for example, but referring to someone, uh, how they identify can save their life and is really important to us, not just as people, but as a Jewish value. So I hope that you will take some time on your own to look through the PDF version of this resource. And um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started now that we've covered kind of that little bit of Jewish framing. So I'm going to provide um, a quick overview of what's happening across the country right now. And um, I'll be frank with you, I'm going to throw a lot of information at you. It's okay if you don't absorb all of it. It's okay if you have questions. Again, please use the Q&A function to submit any questions you have now during the panel throughout our presentation. Um, but I just wanna talk about these three areas, the attacks on uh, so-called critical race theory, abortion access, and LGBTQ plus rights because they're all connected. And while we are here tonight focusing on the attacks on the LGBTQ plus community and how we can fight back, it's really important to highlight how all these attacks are related and how they are connected. So let's start with this anti-critical race theory legislation. So you can see this map here, which shows you the legislation thus far this year. And as you can see, there is no place that has been 
uh, untouched by some kind of legislation or executive action in their state. So let's talk about what is critical race theory. We know that critical race theory is actually a legal theory. It's a legal doctrine. It's not being taught in K through 12. It might be taught in some graduate or maybe undergraduate programs, but it's not something that little kids are learning about. And even if they were, all that critical race theory says is that there are systems of racism in this country based on our history that still linger and still impact folks today. But these bills really are acting as dog whistles and they're seeking to gin up anger at so-called woke culture. And the people that these are aimed at getting angry are definitely hearing the message. These bills often do things like ban the discussion of any kind of discrimination in the classroom, um, ban discussion of racial and sexual assault or discrimination or harassment, um, and others ban books related to slavery or the Holocaust. So while um, this is just another example of the bills that you might have seen going on in Texas and across the country uh, that are aimed at censoring teachers and limiting the information our students can learn in classrooms and really just about ignoring history overall. Next, let's talk about anti-abortion legislation. So you might notice that this map is fairly similar to the last one. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you'll see the legislation from this year, and on the right-hand side, you'll see laws, so legislation that has already passed and been signed into law. Um, so unfortunately, now we live in a post-Roe world, and so this is um, the map of the state of abortion access. So this legislation that's passed this year includes bans on abortion at 15 weeks, 10 weeks, 6 weeks, and even more restrictive bans. Some of this legislation targets doctors for providing abortion care. Some of these bills are targeting medication abortion, which is actually safer than Tylenol and now increasingly common. It makes up more than half of abortions in this country. And other bills are like Texas's bill, um, which allow private citizens to sue people who quote unquote aid and abet in abortion, um, which I'm sure that you all are unfortunately very familiar with now. Many of these bills are now seeking to criminalize medical providers, but in the future, unfortunately, I think we're going to start seeing them more and more targeting pregnant people and people trying to access abortion themselves. So I really wanna just highlight here this legislation, the aim of it is to let the government restrict the bodily autonomy, the healthcare choices of pregnant people. And it's often done in the name of religion. That is a very, very similar theme to what we see with anti-LGBTQ legislation, which is also done to prohibit folks from having bodily autonomy, from making their own healthcare choices, and is also often done in the name of religion. So Unfortunately, as we're going to hear in a minute from Rachel, the bills that we're seeing are probably only likely to get more and more extreme as we move forward, but I just wanted to highlight what's happening at this moment. So now let's talk about anti-LGBTQ plus legislation. So first, let's talk about this map. So um, the darker the state, the higher the number of bills. A uh, note that there is no Texas session in even numbered years, as some of you might be aware of. Um, so the reason that Texas is blank on this map is that there is no session this year. In the first map, it was colored in because the executive branch took some action in Texas. And in the previous map, that was a reflection of laws already passed. But in this map, it's blank because there is no legislative session this year. However, I expect it to unfortunately be fairly dark next session. So as you can see, some states like Tennessee have introduced a lot of bills, over 30. Some, just a few. New York has only had one. But this legislation includes things like the Don't Say Gay bills that you might have heard about um, that ban discussion of gender and sexual identity in, in classrooms and even don't allow straight teachers to talk about their own gender or um, sexual orientation based on how broadly they're written. These bills also criminalize gender affirming health care for trans youth, which we'll talk a little bit more with our panel. And they include other harmful bills that also like the critical race theory legislation prevent teachers from being able to talk about the truth and history with their students and they're really ultimately censorship bills. I also just want to point out specifically when it comes to the bans on gender affirming care that our Jewish value of pikuach nefesh tells us that we put life above all else and ultimately that means protecting access to gender affirming care like hormones and hormone blockers. We know that access to gender affirming care can reduce the risk of suicide among LGBTQ plus youth by up to 60%. So these bills are actually having a real impact right now. Again, I just really wanna circle back to the fact that the reason that we're talking about all three of these different topic areas is because all of these bills 
are connected. They're not separate. In fact, they're coming from the same organizations who are drafting the same bills. And if you look at these bills state to state, they often look the same word for word because they're not grassroots efforts. They're not coming from constituents. Voters don't like write their senator saying, I want you to ban critical race theory. These are coming from extreme organizations and they are spreading quickly. And politicians are jumping on board because they've learned that culture wars can help them win primary elections. And so this is really the dangerous kind of trend that we're seeing at the moment. So now I wanna pass it over to Rachel Hill from Equality Texas, who is going to tell you a little bit more about what specifically is going on in Texas. Rachel? Hi y'all, um, my name is Rachel Hill. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I work for Equality Texas. Uh, we are the largest statewide organization fighting for LGBTQ rights in Texas. Um, so last session, um, as Shannon already said, we didn't have a session this year, even though for some of us it felt like it, and we'll, we'll get to that a little further on in the presentation, but uh, last session in 2021, there were 76 anti-LGBTQ bills filed. That is the most anti-LGBTQ bills filed in any state in the history of the nation in one session. Um, now, part of that is because we had several special sessions. We had the regular and three specials. Uh, but in each of those special sessions, the legislature made sure to target LGBTQ plus Texans. Uh, so what does the landscape look like right now? Um, some good things. Uh, so the pro-LGBTQ plus laws, uh, there are non-discrimination protections in employment on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. This is thanks to a, a recent Supreme Court ruling, the Bostock ruling, uh, and this is implemented in Texas. Um, we also have hate crimes law that protects sexual orientation. Now, it's one of uh, Equality Texas's goals that we can expand that to also cover gender identity, uh, but at least right now, sexual orientation is considered um, a hate crime. And then there are also no formal barriers for updating identity documents, right? Um, and this kind of has two sides to it. Uh, so I'm glad we, we flipped it to the anti side too, because since there are no formal barriers to updating your identity documents, this means that every single judge in Texas gets to decide what that process looks like. Uh, and when I talk about updating identity documents, this is mostly for our transgender Texans who are updating their name or their gender identity. Uh, and so it really depends on where you live. If you're able to access updated identification, which is really, really important if you're uh, applying for a job, checking into a hotel, uh, traveling, think of all the places you use your ID. Uh, Anti-LGBTQ plus laws, uh, there are no protections against discrimination based off of gender identity or sexual orientation in housing or in public accommodations. Uh, so this means, you know, if you don't have your ID updated, uh, you could get kicked out of a hotel when you show that and you're outed. Uh, there are non-inclusive family leave policies. In fact, our entire family code has not been updated to reflect the existence of marriage equality. Um, there is a gay pit trans panic defense that's in existence, which basically uses someone's identity as a legal defense for committing a crime against them. This is ridiculous. Uh, saying because of your identity and because basically I um, I committed a hate crime, I should be protected from the consequences of that. Uh, we, the one bill of the 76 that passed was a anti-transgender sports ban. Uh, that is now law. We still haven't seen how UIL is planning to enforce that law. Um, so that's still an open question. Um, we're going to get to the Governor Abbott's 2022 opinion directing the FPS to investigate loving parents. Um, but uh, we also have no conversion therapy ban covering LGBTQ plus youth and conversion therapy is still alive and well in pockets of this state. Um, and then we also have a very broad religious exemption law, which we weaponizes religion as justification for LGBTQ plus discrimination, which is really hard for uh, LGBTQ people of faith like me um, to see religion used in that way. Um, and then I think I am going to cover a little bit about what did happen outside of session. Uh, so uh, all session long, there were about 26 bills uh, 
um, filed specifically uh, on to ban healthcare access for transgender youth. So like Shannon was saying, this access to life-saving care. Um, and none of them passed, right? Uh, there was no support in the legislature to not, not enough support to pass any of these bills, um, partially because it was recognized what harm it would do to the kids of Texas. Uh, and even though that none of them passed, uh, in February of this year, the governor uh, had a directive to our Department of Family Protective Services based off of a completely uh, disin uh, a misinformed a piece of disinformation by our attorney general. Uh, he wrote a non-binding legal opinion saying that this type of best practice standards care uh, should be considered child abuse and named many, many studies that are debunked or studies where their authors came back and said, hey, that's not what we were trying to say here and really misrepresented the consensus amongst uh, all major medical associations. And based off of that AG non-legally binding opinion, uh, the governor gave a directive to the Department of Family Protective Services to investigate loving families for doing nothing more than giving medical care for their kids. And so when Shannon talks about everything being connected and particularly in that bodily autonomy piece, mm -hmm. um, that's what happened uh, is that they couldn't get something passed during the legislative session. So they looked for another way around it that bypassed the people and bypassed the representatives and just made it happen anyway. Um, now, luckily we do have amazing legal partners um, in Lambda Legal and in the ACLU of Texas that have helped us um, pause those investigations in some instances and those are still ongoing uh, and we will continue fighting. Um, but looking towards 2023, a lot of this is just going to get worse. And I, I do think there's a question later on on, on what we're looking for next session. So um, I will leave it to, to them and open it up to our lovely panel. Does that complete your part of the presentation, Shannon? Okay, awesome. Hello all, good evening. It's lovely to be with you. My name is Avery Bellew. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm the Regional Director for Land Legal South Central Regional Office based in Dallas and one of the partners that Rachel mentioned that's uh, doing work here on the ground in Texas. Really excited to have you all with us this evening. Thank you for joining us. I see a lot of names that I recognize in the participant list, so glad you all are here. Um, as we get started with this next section of the conversation, which is a panel with all the folks you see on your screen, I want to remind you that you have access to a Q&A box. So we are going to have a section at the end to answer your questions. I know we have been throwing a lot of content at you very fast, and this panel has so much expertise. I am sure this section of the conversation uh, will be the same. So please feel free to use that Q&A box so we can get to your questions at the end. Um, I am really uh, excited to uh, introduce you all to the panelists you see here on the screen. So I'm going to invite each of you to introduce yourselves mm -hmm. uh, with your name, your title, the organization that you represent, and your pronouns. And Alexis, we'll start with you. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexis Ranhel. The pronouns are she, they. I am policy counsel with the National Center for Transgender Equality, uh, currently based in DC, uh, but born and raised in Texas, uh, and glad to be here with everyone. Glad that you're with us. Cantor Allen? Hi, my name is Sherry Allen. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a member of the Cantor's Assembly. Uh, RAC Texas and the Inclusive Faith Coalition, which is a group of interfaith uh, clergy who advocate for LGBTQ uh, equality and have a list online of welcoming and affirming congregations. Okay, Sarah. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Kapastashi. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a licensed professional counselor and the clinical director of Out Youth. Welcome, Sarah and Rachel. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself again as a panelist. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm just popping in for a question or two, but um, my name is Rachel Hill, pronouns she, her, hers um, with Equality Texas. 
Fantastic. Well, welcome to all of you. So glad that you all are here. We're going to jump right in because we have a lot to talk about. Um, so Rachel, for this first question, I'm going to return to you. Uh, you gave us a great overview of what happened during the session in 2021, which most people here probably know a lot about that already. You gave some details of some things that have happened outside of the session this year. Um, so if there's anything else you want to say about this year, I would love for you to share that here, but also what should folks be thinking about as we look forward to another legislative session in 2023? What should be on our radar? Yeah, um, I think the, the biggest thing that we've learned is that they're not going to stop, right? Um, they're going to keep pushing these same anti-LGBTQ policies whatever way that they can. Um, now, we were lucky that right now um, the AG's uh, awful opinion is not law. It's not legally binding. Uh, but we know that one of the things that uh, our opposition is going to be pushing the most next session is to codify that into law, um, whether it's simply banning um, health care, gender affirming health care, or whether uh, it is also adding in those investigations from CPS and changing the definition of child abuse. We know that's coming. Um, we know we are likely to see more anti-LGBTQ sports fans, um, more anti, uh, more of those licensed to discriminate bills uh, that use religion kind of as a sword um, to say, hey, I don't want to serve you in any way, shape, or form, or I don't want to give you the health care that you need uh, because it's against my religious beliefs or because you are against my religious beliefs. We know that those are coming um, and we've seen some of these um, quieter attacks on, uh, or they've just gotten more blatant on how they're attacking trans Texans. Um, instead of attacking healthcare or attacking sports, we've seen talks of changing the definition of woman in our state statutes, wherever it appears to be a trans exclusive definition, um, completely erasing trans Texans from the narrative, um, which is just really heartbreaking. And so they've just gotten very, very loud and blatant um, about what they're after. Uh, and all of that and more is <laughs> what we're looking for next session. They've found that this is a really effective tool to mobilize their base and get them, um, get folks who are just misinformed um, or who don't know very much about this community um, riled up and upset and out to vote. And so they're gonna hammer it home. Thanks for that overview and preview, uh, unfortunate preview. And, you know, Rachel, would it be fair to say that it feels like part of a strategy is just to overwhelm us with pure volume of bills? Um, because you mentioned, you cited a statistic about the number, and that number is similar in some other states, we, as we saw in Shannon's graph. So how do you think that kind of plays in a little bit to what we're seeing here? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's, a bombardment and not just in the legislation, but outside, you know, we were talking about using AG opinions. We've had many, many AG opinions filed, not just on healthcare, um, but also on marriage and on other issues that are like LGBTQ plus focused as well, trying to get through that way, tear down just anti non-discrimination protections. Um, we know in Florida, they're trying to ban healthcare through Medicaid um, coverage. And so just any any way that they can get at it. Um, it's just pure volume. Thanks for that, Rachel. Well, mentioning Florida, it seems like Florida and Texas have been in some battle with each other to see who can be the worst state for LGBTQ rights. And um, Alexis, this next question is for you. Um, in Florida, we saw this kind of don't say gay, don't say trans bill. And as Rachel said, we, we've already had some sort of promise that that's probably going to be proposed here in Texas as well. Um, in fact, Lambda Legal today, the organization I work for, just filed a lawsuit along with some others um, addressing uh, this discrimination. Um, so I'd love to hear from you about how this is impacting gay and trans folks. How does this impact the community broadly and folks who are outside the LGBTQ community? Absolutely. I mean, as has been mentioned uh, multiple times, there have been hundreds, uh, hundreds of pieces of legislation uh, attacking uh, the LGBT community and attacking specifically uh, trans folks uh, in, in the ways that they're written and the ways that they're intended to be implemented. Um, and that's through uh, through these school censorship bills uh, around curriculum, through these don't say don't say gay, don't say trans bills, uh, through health care. Um, sports, there's a whole host of uh, host of ways um, that these bills are attacking uh, LGBTQ folks uh, around the country. Um, and the 
overarching impact is creating fear and uncertainty uh, for not only trans folks uh, and queer folks, LGBT folks around the country, but also their families. Uh, there is such a, a heaviness, uh, a fear and anticipation of, of what may be to come, even as we're being successful in fighting back a lot of these bills. Um, the vast majority of, uh, of these bills around the country uh, did not make it through the process and we're, we're, pushed, we're pushed back, uh, but we expect to see a lot of them come back and families are doing their best to plan for what's to come. Uh, and in the, best, in the best of situations, that's a difficult task, but especially when uh, your state government is coming after you uh, or coming after your children, uh, it's, it's terrifying. And people are looking for, uh, looking to figure out how they can get to a safe place or uh, if they're not able to leave, how they can best pr protect their families uh, where they are. Thanks for that, Alexis. And this is happening too within a broader kind of uh, picture of things happening in education more broadly. So we see those bills, um, which obviously are impacting youth, but also youth being able to talk about their parents who are gay and lesbian. Uh, but what other things are happening in the education uh, realm? Uh, on state levels, these uh, these attacks that we've seen uh, focused not only on uh, on the youth themselves and, and censorship uh, and the access to the programs that they might have through school sports uh, or other uh, or other programs, um, but also weaponizing uh, counselors and teachers uh, in the ways that they interact with families. Uh, Texas, uh, their attempt to redefine child abuse uh, is uh, exactly that. It's an attempt to weaponize. Uh, students and their relationships uh, that they have uh, with their teachers, with their counselors. Um, and uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. There's, there's so, so much there. Um, on the federal level, we're seeing some, uh, some great moves by the Department of Education uh, to uh, effectively address a lot, of, uh, a lot of what these bills are doing. Um, the Department of Education in the past year has put out a number of different forms of, of guidance and advice and training resources for schools. Uh, letting them know what their obligations are and also gaining uh, providing resources that they can provide uh, to their faculty, families, and staff. Um, and also in this uh, most recent month, uh, the Title IX, new Title IX regulations were just proposed uh, that we'll be seeing, uh, seeing the process for that play out. Uh, and these new Title IX regulations make it clear that schools must protect uh, the access that students have to their programming uh, and to their school environment on the basis of uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, and also uh, sex characteristics, including intersex people. Uh, so this is a big step forward. There's plenty further to go, but uh, the Department of Education and the administration has been great partners in, in trying to counter a lot of the fear and uncertainty that families are feeling right now. Awesome. Thanks for that, Alexis. And I know here in Texas, another thing which a lot of folks here may know is, of course, school boards are a place where a lot of this is playing out. So it's happening in the state legislature, but also we're seeing a lot of things play out in the school board level, and that's being replicated in states across the country as well. So thanks for providing that overview. Um, so for this next question, we're going to kind of pivot a little bit and place this within the context of what's happening um, culturally more broadly in the United States. Um, we're having a conversation about anti-LGBTQ bias and discrimination, especially as it relates to trans folks tonight. Um, but this is happening within a broader context of the rise of white supremacist groups here in the United States. So um, I would love to hear from, from Shannon and also uh, from um, Sherry about the ways that the LGBTQ community and Jewish community are being targeted. And what is the role of the Jewish community uh, and communities of faith in this fight more broadly? So we yeah, share but go ahead, thank Jim. Thank you. That is a great question. Um, and I think so important for us to recognize how connected all of these fights are and how they're coming after all of us. Not if you're not LGBTQ, they're still coming after you. Um, and as Jews, I think that that is all too familiar for us. And we recognize that. Some people may be familiar with the flyering, people. Um, in white supremacist groups posting flyers in public squares and on college campuses. And now we're seeing white supremacist groups show up in person at riots like we saw at LGBTQ pride parades earlier this year. And it's important to note that this is how those groups fundraise and recruit. So by coming after our groups, they're really getting their name out there and trying to gain members. So I think that's important for us as Jews and supporters and people in the LGBTQ community to recognize. Thanks for that, Shannon. Uh, Sherry, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this question. Well, first of all, um, you know, what's the role of the Jewish community? I think we have to 
first of all, define the fact that, you know, this is, why is this a Jewish issue? <laughs> why specifically is it, you know, among other things, a Jewish issue? And I, I think that there, you know, there's several components of this. First of all, so much of this discussion is based on the mitzvot, the laws, the commandments that we have in the Torah. I mean, um, Shannon mentioned already, Pikuach Nefesh, that the saving of life um, really takes precedence over everything. And these issues are all about trying to save the lives of a community that obviously, um, are that people are, are very much trying to erase. Um, concept of B'Tselem Elohim, that we are all made in God's image, that we're therefore, you know, obligated to respect and, and, Celebrate human dignity, which also is called in Hebrew kavod habriot, the dignity of each human being. And then, of course, you know, you can quote you can quote the Bible, Leviticus. You know, judge your neighbor fairly, love your neighbor as yourself. All of those things. And maybe one of the most important is, you know, this quote from the Talmud, from the um, the Oral Torah, the the commentary on the Torah. Is it, we are told that if we save one life, it's as if we've saved the whole world. And if we destroy one life as if we destroyed the world. And um, there's a lot of attempts right now to destroy a, a world here. And so it is incumbent upon us, specifically as Jews, to do something about that. And not just to talk about it, but to take action, especially because I think too often um, religion can be used to alienate and reject, especially LGBTQ folks, leaving them to feel abandoned by God and, and their community. So it's important that we need to constantly be sending the message as a Jewish community that Judaism affirms and celebrates uh, their existence. And not to mention the fact that, you know, there's a long history of Jewish involvement in this. Uh, one of the pioneers in the groundbreaking field of gender and sexuality was a Jewish doctor named Magnus Hirschfeld, who in 1919 opened his Institute of Sexual Science in Berlin and, and offered medical care and education in some of the first gender confirmation surgeries. So we have that history. People think, oh, this is such a new thing. No, it isn't. <laughs> no, it isn't. Um, and I guess most importantly too, there's the sense of this is not just them versus us. Why should this be important? We have to support this community. It's our community too. I mean, the Jewish umbrella envelops a plethora of intersectional Jewish and gender identities, right? And ethnicities and cultures, our fates are all intertwined. So, um, you know, it also might, uh, surprised me to know that according to uh, a recent Pew Research study, one in 10 Jewish adults identify as gay or lesbian, you know, so, so it really is our community as well. And in terms of what our role in this community now, what is our role as Jewish allies? One, to be affirming congregations, right, in, within our places of worship, right? And what does that mean? That means, again, using, identifying by pronouns, um, making sure, in fact, there's an article, interesting article I just read in um, reformjudaism.org, uh, which is aptly entitled, Why Pronouns Are So Important and Why Using the Right Ones is So Jewish. <laughs> and, um, and the quote is, uh, this, the writer was referring to individuals using their correct pronouns conveys respect and validation to everyone in our communities. And part of the Jewish imperative to treat others the way we should be treated, which goes back to being made in God's image. And then once we, you know, establish pronouns to practice using them, so misgendering doesn't, you know, isn't as likely to happen. Um, and then, you know, again, using signage to indicate that your congregation is LGBTQ welcoming is and making it a priority to use inclusive language in classrooms, um, in prayer, on synagogue websites, and printed materials, offices, and also education. You know, in, in, inclusivity training should be an ongoing project, consistent and continually updated. And then, of course, for all of us as individuals and congregations, organizations to advocate, to sign petitions and call our elected officials and show up at protests and rallies and all of those things. So that is how we as both community and as individuals uh, can can do our can do our part. And I think that there is this mandate in Judaism that demands we do that. Thank you so much, Sherry, for kind of creating a, a robust vision of how this is a Jewish conversation and locating us in that. And of course, I share that passion for that history of you, which that trans history, which is Jewish history. Um, so this is a very Jewish conversation we're having this evening for those of us that are Jewish on the call. And thanks for explaining that to us and what we should be doing 
um, within the context of Jewish community. Thank you for that. Um, we want to talk a little bit now about the impact. Um, you got really a, a great overview from Shannon and from Rachel of what's been happening. Um, many of you may have known parts of this, but perhaps not all of it. Uh, it's a pretty bleak picture when you put it all together and slide after slide. Um, but behind each of these states colored in on a map are individuals, people, families. Um, and so I want to hear a little bit, um, starting really with you, Sarah, about the impact of this on, on youth, on families, and adults. Yes, thank you for that, Avery. And I'm just going to invite everybody, because I need to do this myself as well before talking about these topics, to take a deep breath. Just take a deep breath with me. And out. I might be able to tell I'm a therapist. So I will say that focusing specifically on the recent issue regarding gender affirming care being characterized as child abuse, I would just invite everybody on this call, whether you are a parent, whether you've been a caregiver, whether you are uh, just a part of a young person's life, you've been a mentor to somebody, you've supported them, um, you've watched them grow and change and, you know, maybe part of that change was somebody really fighting to understand and know who they are. And they come to that place and they're brave enough to say, this is who I am. And as the loving person um, in that young person's life, you say, yes, I wanna support you. And in the case of transgender creative non-binary youth, sometimes this does mean seeking out gender affirming care uh, because every credible medical and mental health uh, organization says this is the standard of care. And then I want you to imagine the state of Texas says, we're going to come after you for that. We're going to come after you for providing this standard of care that every expert recommends and that you had to do your own work sometimes to really see and accept in the young person that you care about so much. And so this is what I see um, as I talk to family after family, caregiver after caregiver, in terms of the impact that um, our attorney general and our governor have had um, in defining gender affirming care as child abuse and just the absolute pain and fear and terror that folks are experiencing. Um, it's also very difficult when, you know, you sit down, let's say with the 12 year old um, who's beautiful and wonderful, uh, really loves drag, really loves playing video games. Um, and they tell you, I'm terrified because I have tons of anxiety because I think my family wants to move because they don't think they can keep me safe. So there is a real world impact that is happening for trans youth and their families. I will also say though that I am lucky enough, I'm a cisgender therapist. I work a lot with the trans community, but I also have uh, trans colleagues um, who work with me at Out Youth who are incredibly caring uh, social workers and you know folks that have a huge love um, for this community. And this is incredibly hard on them as well. So it not only affects uh, trans youth and, and families, but it also really has an impact um, on trans adults. It really brings up a lot of those feelings of, you know, I wish I was supported in this way when I was young, maybe I wasn't. And to think about like what it would be like to have affirming care um, kind of at your fingertips and then have it taken away. Um, and then that's the last thing I would say too, is that unfortunately, despite the fact that uh, these uh, directives do not have the force of law, it still had an incredible chilling effect um, on the medical community specifically. So a lot of you have probably read how uh, gender affirming care is now being um, limited in some spots um, because of that fear. Um, of possible lit litigation. Um, and so people's access to care is, is really being um, affected um, in these ways, which is really, really devastating. 
Thank you for that, Sarah. And thank you for everything you're doing as an affirming therapist. Um, that is deeply meaningful. Um, Alexis, I'm going to pose the same kind of question to you. Uh, what are you hearing about the impact, the real world impact of these bills, the threat of these bills, and um, other kind of go government overreach uh, into our private lives? Well, part of it is this uh, is, is this fear and anxiety and uh, mental health struggle um, that's, uh, you know, plainly apparent, but also recognized and backed up by data. The Trevor Project has looked into uh, what happens uh, to the calls that they're receiving after these kinds of bills are introduced and these conversations are being had. Um, and so that's a very important thing to, to identify. Um, another aspect uh, that's not talked about as much uh, is that... Uh, LGBT folks and trans folks uh, are fighting back, are, are putting together uh, efforts, um, organizing uh, protests at their state legislatures, um, uh, talking to uh, their elected officials, uh, engaging with the public in ways that they hadn't before. Uh, in this past year, we've seen uh, a number uh, of, of high level meetings uh, with the Biden administration, with trans youth that have happened with HHS, with the White House, um, talking about their experiences um, during the legislative session uh, that happened in Texas, there were a number uh, of uh, trans folks who uh, came forward, particularly young trans folks, to tell their stories uh, in committee hearings um, and that are showing up. Uh, and we see that across the country. There's even been a number of, uh, of very visible protests that have happened in schools uh, that are pushed uh, that are pushing. Uh, for uh, anti-LGBTQ policies uh, in Florida and Washington and school discipline cases that are coming up because students are standing up for their classmates. Uh, and so there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety, uh, but there's also a lot of action. Uh, and I'm continually inspired by the young LGBT folks and young trans folks uh, for the work that they're doing on the ground in their communities. Thank you, Alexis, for highlighting the resiliency and the courage and the strength along with the challenges. Um, I think that's really uh, important for all of us to hold on to because that is so very true. Um, so thank you both for describing that. Um, so I wanna pivot for a moment to you, Shannon, and talk about how these bills are having an impact on folks outside the LGBTQ community um, and how exactly that's playing out. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that that's such an important question, especially because when we talk about this, we so often default to just how this is affecting the LGBTQ community directly. And obviously that's important. And those are the people most directly facing harm and the threat. And also this has a larger impact on our communities and even people who might not consider themselves a part of the same community as LGBTQ plus folks. So for example, um, we talked about how there are efforts to rip families apart just for supporting their trans kids. Those parents aren't necessarily a part of the LGBTQ plus community, but they're directly being impacted by this in a very, very large way. Um, we also are seeing, for example, the, the Don't Say Gay bill that passed in Florida and is now being modeled in other states is written so broadly and was crafted so quickly and messily that basically it includes any mention of gender or, or sexual orientation in the classroom. So if a straight teacher refers to herself as Mrs. or if she talks about her husband, she could technically be sued for that. Um, and so these bills are so blatantly not just bigoted, but they're not well thought through to the point where like they have such broad impacts and are harmful to so many people beyond just like who they claim to be targeting. Thanks for that, Shannon. Uh, before we head into kind of our final a couple of questions, I want to offer a reminder to everyone here that if you have some questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we'll attend to those in our last few moments together. But um, Sarah, I actually want to return to you because there's a second part to our conversation related to the impact related to what gender affirming care really is. And you said a couple of statements around the fact that it is um, you know, it is something that there's a lot of professional standards around, but I think there's also a lot of confusion around what it is and is not. And it seems that some folks are really seeking to leverage that to do harm. So I'd love if you could shed some light on what exactly is gender affirming care? Who's receiving it? What kind of care are they receiving? Yes, I really appreciate this question for sure. So I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV, um, but I do hang out with some really incredible medical doctors who do provide gender affirming care at all sorts of levels. But I will say, I think one thing to keep in mind is a lot of times when we're talking about affirming gender for um, a very young person, 
um, we aren't talking about any sort of medical intervention at all. Um, we're talking about finding community. We're talking about uh, affirming things through uh, using proper pronouns, using names, maybe some fashion is involved. Um, so those are kind of the initial steps um, that a lot of affirming wonderful parents and caregivers go through um, as their, their child, um, you know, maybe comes out, maybe is in the process of exploring their gender um, and really making that a child-led uh, parent-supported process. So, some families at some point in that early process um, do decide to seek out um, some help from the medical establishment. So the first thing that could look like for some young people um, and their families is something called puberty blockers. So puberty blockers is usually the first medical intervention um, that people consider. And here's the thing. Puberty blockers are given at a very specific point in time in somebody's development. Um, so they really have to be um, kind of preteen. Um, there's actually specific stages called the Tanner stages that, that doctors look at when deciding whether uh, puberty blockers are appropriate. And what puberty blockers do is they just put a pause on puberty. They just say, we want to uh, kind of cease any sort of secondary sex characteristics from potentially developing. Um, so my young person doesn't have to experience uh, certain aspects potentially of physical gender dysphoria, which is when, um, you know, your gender identity, who you know yourself to be, and aspects of your appearance or your body don't match. Um, that can feel like dysphoria and can be really hard on somebody's mental health. So all puberty blockers do, which have been used for years for other conditions, by the way, and are very safe and effective, it just puts pause on that process. Um, at some point later on, some folks might decide to start hormone replacement therapy. So um, that's hormones, um, so that somebody's uh, gender identity and you know their physical appearance can better match um, who they know their, themselves to be. Um, so some people decide to go down that road. Um, not all trans and non-binary folks decide um, to have any medical intervention, in fact, but some do. Um, and the important thing to keep in mind with either of those things is it's really a, a team effort. Um, um, the reason I hang out with medical doctors is because a lot of times I'm part of the process. Um, so a young person is sometimes seeing a therapist or a social worker to talk through these things um, in consultation um, with a wonderful medical provider um, and the caregivers um, as well. So it's really a team effort. Um, so that's a little bit about what gender affirming care looks like um, for uh, kids, preteens and teens. Thank you, Sarah, for that beautiful summary. I wish I could just record that, except I think this is being recorded because so we just replay that. It's a great summary. And some of the things that, that stood out from what you said uh, were that it doesn't always involve a medical intervention. Of course, if it does, it's with a big team of people uh, that are working in concert to make that happen, working in concert around best practices. Um, but that there's a lot of different things that fall under gender affirming care. And I think it's so important to make sure that we're actually um, exposing ourselves to facts on this issue because there's so much misinformation right now. So thank you for clearing that up for us, setting a groundwork and a foundation so we're all clear on what gender affirming care is and what it is not. Um, so this is gonna transition us towards our, our last overall question for this group. Um, and then I think we have some additional questions to address. And again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to use the Q&A box, but this is a question really for everyone on this screen. Um, I've heard a lot of you use the word ally as we're talking today, um, and uh, that's a word we commonly hear used. I know in our preparatory work, we talked about how many of us, instead of saying ally, say something like work along in solidarity with, uh, be in solidarity with a community. So whatever term we may use, whether it's allyship or if we choose to kind of pivot that to something more action oriented, like being in solidarity with a community, um, there's something for all of us to do. And in my mind, part of what we've been doing today is uh, having a conversation about kind of two of my favorite questions, which is what needs to be done and what is mine to do? And I think we've established throughout this conversation, there is a lot that needs to be done, but the trickier part can be answering that second question, which is what is mine to do? 
So I would love to hear from each one of you. Um, what do you think that each one of us as individuals can do as a community, as individuals to build allyship, to help people to stand in solidarity with our LGBTQ community? Um, and I'm just going to go around the screen and kind of call each of you out if that's okay. Um, and I will start with you, Rachel. I think I'm I'm going to start with the the policy kind of world um, advocate world, uh, and so what it looks like to be an ally is to make sure you are talking to your friends and family about these issues because the only way that politicians can harness this energy is through like people just not knowing, right? Um, you have the hateful people, but then you have a large swath of people who just don't know, and so talking about it with your friends and family and, and fighting that misinformation and then uh, taking that next step to um, follow one of the many organizations that are doing this work in Texas um, and get alerted when some of these hateful bills are happening and write your elected officials. Um, you can submit testimony online or submit it through us and we can hand deliver it for you. Um, and if you're in the Austin area, um, show up and testify. Uh, it, sometimes it's so hard to be in those hearings when it's only uh, the group that is most impacted, right? And to have um, folks come in and testify and say, hey, you are targeting my neighbor or you are targeting um, the person that I sit next to in temple or like just reminding them that everyone is watching and that we are all Texans um, something that Equality Texas, the slogan that we use is if you attack one Texan, you attack all Texans. And um, the more that we can really like stand in solidarity with each other um, on all of these issues and show that, uh, the, the further we'll go at the Capitol. Thank you for that, Rachel. Uh, Rachel. Sarah, I will turn over to you now. Same question for you. Sure. I, I think what comes to mind for me, and I left this out of my answer earlier about, you know, how this is impacting folks kind of at a ground level. Um, I really appreciate uh, what Shannon said, kind of tying sort of these issues of, of white supremacy um, to, you know, what we're seeing in terms of these attacks um, on Texans, particularly transgender Texans. And I think I think the most about, you know, certainly I, I feel for those families who, um, you know, are struggling with decisions of like, do I stay in the state or do I take my family and do I leave because it's just such a hostile place um, for my family right now. But I also really worry about those families who just don't have those resources, um, just don't have those financial resources in order to make that same decision. Um, and so I would encourage, there were some funds that popped up um, and hopefully will continue to pop up that are financial funds that support families um, who want to make those, those decisions. So I would say that's one way um, to show allyship. Um, I will also say kind of connected to this, I, I always want to center the experiences of Black, Indigenous, and, and people of color in these conversations wherever I can, um, because we know the rhetoric of a lot of these bills just increases the violence and we know that certain communities are the target of violence over and over again, uh, particularly black trans women. Um, so I would say another way to, to be a good ally is just to find um, uh, black led organizations um, here in Texas. I can recommend one right now. It's called Black Trans Leadership of Austin. We've been working with them very closely um, on several projects. And so um, they do lovely mutual aid funds kind of lift up the community. Um, so I would say, you know, one way to, to show allyship if you um, have some of that privilege of financial resources is to, to find really great reputable places to, to support folks and give those funds. Also, thank you for those suggestions, Sarah, all wonderful, wonderful opportunities to be in solidarity. Uh, Alexis, I'll turn over to you. Same question for you. Um, well, I think that what I have to say on this is largely similar to what uh, Rachel and Sarah both talked about. Um, the way that I would frame it is um, is to first listen and then second to speak. Um, listening and centering the people who are being affected by uh, by these things the most. Uh, listening to LGBT folks uh, when these things are happening and 
for what they say that they need, listening to trans folks, listening particularly to trans and non-binary folks of color, uh, organizations uh, that are advocating for them and that are led by them. Uh, another organization that I could suggest uh, to look to uh, is the Transgender, uh, Transgender Education Network of Texas. Uh, is another fantastic organization led by Emmett Schilling uh, and is doing some great work. Um, but listening to folks and then also listening to young people, uh, listening to young people talk about the world that they envision uh, and what they need to feel safe and secure uh, about their futures. Uh, and then the second part is to speak, take all these experiences uh, and be visible, talk to your friends and family, but in particular, uh, talk to the young people in your life uh, about what you're, uh, what you're seeing and hearing and experiencing uh, and make it known that you're a safe person uh, for, that pers for that young person uh, to be vulnerable to. Uh, last month, uh, Pew put out a study that said 5% uh, of uh, adults 18 to 30 identify as trans or non-binary, which is a huge number. Uh, and we expect that the number of folks who are 18 and younger is going to be even higher than that, maybe as high as 10%. Uh, so there's a very, very good chance that the young people in your life uh, are trans and non-binary, are LGBTQ, uh, and are having these thoughts and feeling this anxiety. Uh, and so make it known uh, that these are the kinds of people that you're listening to, that these are the things you're advocating for and that you are a safe person for them to be vulnerable with. Thank you so much, Alexis. All really good recommendations. Um, Sherry, what about you? Same question for you. What would you offer to folks is theirs to do? Okay, ditto, ditto, ditto for Sarah, Alexis, Shannon. Uh, but personally from just, um, you know, the perspective of, of being a clergy person too, to share our stories. Like I, one thing I didn't share with you tonight, but I am the proud, not just a cantor, but I'm a proud parent of three LGBTQ plus children, adult children. Um, I, have a, I have a cisgender gay son, I have a cisgender bisexual daughter, and I have a transgender son, uh, a queer transgender son, who I have shared, I, I've tried to normalize their stories and experiences and share their stories with um, the congregation that I was with formerly. I made, I, I wanted just basically to, you know, to, to make this part of the conversation so that they, you know, had some sort of context about, oh, we know these people, these, you know, we, we can relate so that there is not just some group of people out there, you know, these are my kids. These are, you know, people that, you know, as well. So, you know, share stories of people that, you know, either in your family, yourself, your friends, um, who, you know, who, who, who can really, you know, normalize this for other people too, and make it more familiar. Um, confirm and validate, obviously was, was mentioned before, when other, I mean, other people's stories as well. Um, write, not just speak out, write. I mean, I've written a lot, a lot of op-eds because I find that, you know, sometimes I'm just so curious, I got to put it on paper and, and people and in, in, in newspaper, they'll, they'll publish them. You know, they, they really will. Um, and, and so that's another way to get the, the word out publicly. I also um, kind of had the chutzpah. but I, I wrote my house representative and sent the letter to his home address because he happens to be a neighbor of mine. And um, I had never approached him before. And I felt like maybe from a personal, you know, like if you could approach whoever you're calling, your senators, your Congress people from a personal point of view, not just, it's great to sign a letter that you get, you know, a petition in the mail, but to actually approach them from a personal point of view, share your story, make it real to them, perhaps that will, you know, nudge the little the needle just a little bit. So that, those would be my recommendations. Thank you, Sherry. And Shannon, what about you? Same question for you. Yeah, so first I would just echo everything that everyone has said. Um, and then my answer was gonna be kind of along the lines of what someone sent in the Q&A um, in terms of standing up and speaking out and not just being silent. I think um, that it's, much easier to think about why that's important if you kind of reconceptualize fighting for LGBTQ rights for yourself and for those that you talk about it with. And what I mean by that is it's not some issue on the periphery. It's not some issue on the sidelines that just affects this group of people over here. We've talked about how it affects all of us. And also the way that LGBTQ plus folks are being targeted right now is so, so familiar to us as Jews. Like the re-emerging rhetoric that LGBTQ plus people are pedophiles or grooming children, that is something that Jews have faced for centuries, going all the way back to blood libel. And so 
thinking about what it might feel like to you as a Jew now or throughout history if someone didn't speak up, that is what the LGBTQ plus community is facing right now. And so I think that it's about saving lives. It's about the fact that using someone's pronouns can actually be life-saving for them. And so being accepting is a radical act. And I think that having that in your mind when you are going about your daily life, but also when this topic comes up in conversations with others is really important to reframe that issue. Thank you for that, Shannon. Um, one of the things I'm hearing you say is to have empathy. And I once heard someone describe empathy as your pain in my heart. So whatever kind of connection you can make um, to experience some of what folks are saying today and then having that motivate you to act, you can answer that question, what is mine to do? Um, I want to say a thank you to all of you. Uh, this has been such an amazing conversation. Unfortunately, we are at the end of our time together. Um, so Margie, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Avery. And thank you to each and every one of our panelists today. This was really an impactful session tonight. And one of the things that I think we learned is we need to do a part two. Um, there is so much more that we have to talk about and so much more that we can do together as a community that I think we'll, we'll be seeing a part two uh, continuation of this conversation. I wanna thank Keshet and Equality Texas for partnering with ADL on this um, amazing program. And of course, we will send a link of the recording to everybody who has joined us tonight. So be sure to share that link and share the recording for uh, to your network and let others hear this amazing talk. We will also provide a lot of the links to the resources that were mentioned tonight on tonight's call. Again, I wanna thank each and every one of you for attending and for our amazing panelists. This will conclude our program for tonight. Thank you so much. Be safe out there, everyone. Thank you. Bye, all.